So please join me in welcoming Mr. Bahar Azmi, whose speech is titled, Human Rights Lawyering in the War on Terror. I don't have a dynamic PowerPoint presentation, um, just some paper through which uh, I would like to tell you a story about a client. I first saw my client on a TV screen. Before my initial meeting with Murat Kornaz in October 2004, camouflaged US military police escorted me, the third civilian lawyer to enter Guantanamo's, uh, the inner sanctum of Guantanamo's Camp Echo through several 15-foot high lock gates and into the guard booth of this notorious military prison. On my way to the guard booth, walking across gravel made bright white by the blazing Caribbean sun, my status as a lawyer, clean-shaven in a suit and formal shoes, was punctuated by the loud sounds of practice machine gunfire in the distance. This would be no ordinary client meeting. The military showed me the surveillance they would employ during my meeting with my client. Murat appeared there on a video screen, waiting for me. The image was dark and blurry, like the grainy picture on a store security camera, but unsettling. I could see a man with a beard and hair befitting a prehistoric warrior. President Bush had claimed that everyone in Guantanamo was the worst of the worst. Sworn killers, enemies of civilization, so vicious they, threw, they chewed through cable wire to kill. So this image was not comforting to me. The military also told me that Murat would be chained to the floor, so I shouldn't be worried about him assaulting me. I braced myself and prepared to meet him alone. When the door to our meeting room in Camp Echo opened, he was seated with legs shackled to a bolt on the floor, and he was squinting from the incoming sunlight. Dressed in a short, tan shirt and cotton pants, with a flowing beard and red-brown mane of hair, he looked like someone who had been shipwrecked on a desert island, which in a sense, he was. He shook my hand and motioned for me to sit across from him on a flimsy plastic chair, as if he were welcoming me to tea in his home. I tried to sound confident. <clears throat> Murat, my name is Bahar Azmi. I am a lawyer. I do not work for the US government. Your family asked me to help you. I handed him a handwritten note from his very worried mother to help, him, help convince him I was on his side. This was a considerable concern because in the, in, the, in the past three years, he had met no human beings who were not military guards or interrogators. Would he trust me? The simple honesty and loving reassurance of his mother's message still moves me. My dear son Murat, you will be visited by an American lawyer whom you can trust. His name is Bahar Azmi. Your, Murat, your brothers go to school, and we have been for vacation in Turkey. We were shopping with Nagi Honda, his then wife, and she is loving you. As I watched his pained expression while reading his first message from home, his first taste of humanity in three years, I felt as though I was delivering a crumb of bread to Robinson Crusoe. I continued to explain that his mother had been fighting for years for him back home, and that I had filed a case for him in US court in an attempt to challenge his indefinite detention. He had never been charged with any crime, let alone put on trial. Indeed, because he had been held incommunicado for almost three years, he had no idea that anyone knew of Guantanamo's existence or his own existence. I also told him I was born in Egypt, was Muslim, and a law professor with a great faith in the American legal system. You have sued President Bush, he asked. Yes, you and I have sued him together, and I will do everything I can to help you, I answered. And to my relief, he said, with a heavy German accent, okay, this is good. So what brought me, a lawyer and a law professor who lived in downtown Manhattan only two miles from the horrors of ground zero to this strange, intimidating place? It's a fair question, and I asked myself that repeatedly the moments before meeting someone the entire country assumed was a terrorist. I think that the answer to that question has everything to do with what I believe the role of a lawyer should be. Uh, let me explain. Guantanamo is a very strange place. It is a military base owned and operated by the United States in Cuba, of all places. At its peak, it held 800 Muslim men and boys supposedly apprehended on the battlefield, a claim we, we later conclusively proved to be false. They were label, labeled enemy combatants by the Bush administration and denied the protections of any law whatsoever. The administration chose Guantanamo intentionally as an area outside the jurisdiction of the courts, 
It was a place where only the president and his military commanders would act as prosecutor, judge, and jury. It was a prison beyond the law. As a lawyer, I was very skeptical of the president's actions, and as a human rights lawyer, I could not understand how you could deny the rights to individuals that make us members of the human community. Could there really be a place created by the president that was totally beyond the rule of law, shrouded in complete secrecy? And what do we even mean when we talk about the rule of law? That perhaps it's helpful to think of its opposite, which was very present in Guantanamo. In the absence of law, there is only will, power, discretion. So in denying the application of law to a place like Guantanamo prison, the president was asserting a power to do anything he or his commanders wanted to do at any time in total darkness, regardless of their consequences. The lawyer's role then, it seemed to me, in our constitutional system is to question an official's claim to power and ultimately to force government officials to give good reasons any time they deprive individuals of rights. And it's also their role to affirm, affirm the dignity of their clients, including unpopular clients. This is because an incarcerated person is more than the accusation made against him. The poor have few, a far harder time managing our legal system than the well-endowed. Unpopular clients need lawyers as much as anyone. And as a lawyer, you may often be the only voice for persons the majority would love never to hear from. And that by speaking loudly on behalf of the voiceless is a profoundly important act. And this is true not only when a government official acts. Many large institutions in modern life, private or governmental, make decisions out of mere habit, prejudice, or misinformation. Those decisions frequently have harmful impact on the poor, marginalized members of society. And yet great justices have been advanced in our history by humane lawyers who have insisted there are no longer good reasons to segregate school children by race, to deny persons the opportunity to express dissent freely, or to subject persons to unreasonable workplace ha hazards or the excesses of the marketplace. So when lawyers ask hard questions and demand good reasons, when lawyers hold those in power to account for their actions, they illuminate our democratic institutions for ourselves and the world. So I hope that gives you some insight into why I made that first trip to visit my client in Guantanamo. And indeed, after my first visit, my skepticism was rewarded. The government's evidence connecting him to terrorism was so tangential as to be preposterous. There was no good reason to hold him, and we convinced a federal court of this. But equally important, in the many dozens of hours we spent together there, across a flimsy table, the initial blurry image of him I saw on that TV screen came into clear focus. Murat was certainly not the terrorist the government claimed him to be. He was also not merely a tool in some epic constitutional battle being waged against the president. He was the young son of a worried sick mother, the brother to two young boys he was unable to recognize after five years away from home. He's outrageously funny and quick to laugh. He's obsessively concerned about my health and well-being. He thinks I should leave New York City and live in the country. In short, he is a profoundly human being. So as much as I started this case to take on an abstract principle, his case had become, as I, as I would stress all cases do, about a client, a living, breathing, a feeling person. And let me conclude by telling you about the first time I saw Murat outside a cell. In August 2006, German officials told my German co-counsel, Bernhardt, and me the date that Murat would likely be released, which gave me enough time to fly to Germany for the occasion. On August 24th, 2006, Bernhardt and I met the whole Kurnaz family at a gas station outside of their hometown in Bremen, Germany, for the six-hour drive south towards Rammstein Air Force Base, where we were told he would be arriving in the early evening. The day was full of intrigue, secret meetings with German officials to find out the location of the meeting place for the Kurnaz family reunion, constant intrusive calls from German and American reporters demanding confirmation of a spreading rumor of his release, and almost crippling anxiety. While we awaited Murat's arrival in a Red Cross senior citizen's home, we saw through the window a huge C-17 military plan descending from the sky. It was Murat. Murat's mother, Rabia, who had been fighting tirelessly and courageously for her son's release for years, as well as Murat's father, his two brothers, assembled in the hallway on the fourth floor to greet Murat. Rabia stood in front of the creaky elevator doors. Her anticipation built to an almost unbearable level as the elevator repeatedly started 
and stopped, huffed and creaked. Finally, when the doors opened, Rabia latched onto her son as if he might be taken away from her again at any moment. With Murat in her arms, she wept helplessly for a long time. And in the incredible excitement of that very long day, including a 3 a.m. rush into the Karnaz home past the swarm of waiting journalists, I remember one thing more clearly than any other. During the many hours that Murat and I had spent together in Guantanamo, his ankle had always been chained to the floor. And so that day, for the first time, I saw Murat walk. 